Previously on Ben Again. Run, you pigeons! It's Robert Frost! Oh! Get out of here, run! Bang, bang, bang. Go, 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 Six months ago, we got to see Manny Calavera begin to unravel a deep-rooted governmental conspiracy. It was a relatively fun experience, even if it was a bit glitchy. The puzzles were often confusing and frustrating, but the story more than made up for it with interesting characters and a captivating plot. This video is part two in a series covering the entirety of Grim Fandango. If you haven't seen part one, please click the link below to watch it first, otherwise you'll have absolutely no idea what's going on here. With that out of the way, it's time for Grim Fandango Year Two, now with working audio. Manny is now the owner of Calavera Cafe, the refurbished version of the rundown establishment from year one. It isn't stated how he managed to rise in the ranks and take it over in such a short period of time, but he's clearly owned the place for a while and has been behind many additions like a casino. Manny is shown to be a very competent businessman, further proving that his boss was sabotaging his career. Manny is very familiar with sabotage, as he frequently rigs the games on the roulette tables below to boost the company's earnings. He rigs a game without looking, earning a tarnished reputation with the chief of police, who Manny usually lets win to keep the cafe protected. Before heading downstairs, Manny grabs a letter he recently received from Salvador. The two have been keeping in contact over the course of the last year so that Manny can still help out the LSA. It sounds like they've successfully managed to hatch eggs to train carrier pigeons to deliver messages quickly and without worries of interception. Manny heads downstairs, stopping to talk to Lupe, the head of Coat Checkery? Whatever the job title is, she looks after the coats of the guests and is incredibly enthusiastic about it. Lupe tells Manny that Police Chief Bogan left the establishment fuming. Manny slides down to the dining and casino area, running into Glottis, the pianist for the Calavera Cafe. Glottis is confused about Bogan leaving, but he doesn't let it interrupt the flow of his musical genius. <laughs> What? Oh god. Oh no. <laughs> no. After that wonderful tune, Manny snags a bottle of his finest liquor, a bottle with solid gold flakes inside. In the casino, Manny finds the guest that requested his presence, a short man named Charlie, who was told not to show up until he's ready to pay off his bar tab. Charlie shows off a ticket printer that he stole from a cellmate, which Manny promptly takes from the man, claiming he'll return it as soon as the debt is repaid. After this, Manny leaves the establishment, with a shadowy figure immediately grabbing his attention upon his exit. Meiji? Manny, help me. I've been lost for so long. Why didn't you look for me? I did. You ran off. Why? Because you said I was no good. I've been all alone in the world for a whole year. And it's all because of you! <laughs> The mysterious silhouette turns out to be some kind of mimicry bird sitting atop a binocular stand. It mimics Mercedes before flying off. Manny races to the binoculars, peering through them to find Mercedes being kidnapped by Domino and forced onto a boat. Manny gives chase, diving for the ramp and managing to grab hold. Before he can climb any further, Mercedes herself pushes him off the edge via a bottle to the forehead. Just like last year, Velasco is forced to fish Manny out of the murky waters. Velasco tells Manny that the ship Mercedes was on is heading towards Puerto Zapato, which is all the way on the other side of the world. The closest boat, the Limbo, is also heading that way. Manny says that in that case, he's already on board. Velasco laughs and wishes him good luck. I'm sure this means absolutely nothing and won't get in the way at all anytime soon. The map for year two is massive. Instead of having multiple smaller locations strung together as the plot progresses, like in year one, we have a single, massive area to explore. It took our recording group 50 minutes to explore everything and find our first goal. Upon leaving the dock, Manny arrives at a central hub of sorts with four pathways. The dock is on the right pathway, which leaves Manny to choose between up, down, and left. Manny goes down, leading to some kind of yard with tracks on the ground. There are two locked doors that never open up, a lever-activated bridge to the right, and a rickety staircase downward that leads to a rundown building that you can climb into. Inside is a tattoo parlor where a sailor is getting inked. Across the other bridge is a cat racing track. Think of it like a horse track where people can place bets, but with massive, oddly colored cats instead. There's an equally large litter box next to stacks of huge cat food cans. Manny snags a can opener from one of them before heading up the stairs to a security checkpoint manned by someone named Carla. She's not the sharpest. It's a metal detector. Oh, that explains why it never gets my hair dry. 
Manny asks for the metal detector, but Carla won't show it to him until her break at dawn. Technically, they could go to the back room for an early break if Manny were forced to do a strip search by failing the security check after taking all his belongings out of his pockets, but he doesn't exactly know how to pull that off. For now, Manny leaves and heads to the path upwards of the central hub, taking him to the bar, the Blue Casket. Inside, Manny runs into Lola, who's on a stakeout. She's dead set on proving to Maximino, the owner of the cat racing joint, that his partner Olivia is being unfaithful. And with his own lawyer Nick, no less. Shh, here they come. Come on, sugar. How about a kiss for the road? Oh, ick. Don't let me down, Nick. You're a lawyer. You're not supposed to have feelings. I don't, but I know a good tart when I see one. Hey! If Maximino sees that, we're going to end up in matching terracotta pots. Don't be silly. He wouldn't hurt me. He loves me. Uh. Nick rushes off to get his hands on Lola's photo while Manny gathers information from Olivia. You might have noticed her neck aggressively twitching for a moment in that cutscene. Olivia's animations are quite broken, and she'll frequently twitch about during conversations. Hey. You're running after that ghost chick everyone says you're still so uptight about. Well, I have a poem I wrote just for you. Pay attention, because it's pretty short. Here it goes. Ch uh, 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 mm. <laughs> what? What? That went pretty fitting with the vibrating motion. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> it was. It did. Was. It. I can't tell what's intentional and what's not anymore. Me either, man. I don't know what's happening. In the kitchen nearby, Manny stumbles in on a waiter mixing up some coffin shooters. The secret ingredient is dirty hookah water. How delicious. I was wondering why I couldn't move, I was worried. I kinda love this game because we can't tell what it's broken. <laughs> that secret ingredient is a knockout, literally. It just knocked a customer out cold. Maybe that'll come in handy later. Unfortunately, Manny has no way of transporting the hookah water. In the corner, he finds a group of people talking about the revolution, but they don't believe that he's familiar enough with their scene to join the discussion. Manny moves on, heading up an elevator to the left which leads right back to the Calavera Cafe. South of the elevator is the morgue, where the coroner is examining two bodies that have been sprouted. He doesn't have the tools he needs to identify the bodies anytime soon, so Manny leaves him to get his work done. Above the morgue is a jail cell, although it's empty for right now. Manny returns to the central hub, taking a walk down the leftmost and final path. Here stands some sea bees, which are man-sized bees that are doing construction work. At least, they would be if they felt that they weren't being neglected by their union. They won't pay some of the fees, and therefore they've been placed on barrel duty. Manny suggests they level a complaint due to their exploitation, but the bees laugh it off as absurd. They seem to have some serious thoughts about their working conditions, but they don't really have the words to express them. Well, that's just about everything to look at for right now, so Manny returns to the docks to ask Velasco when they're leaving. All right, so I'm ready to sail. On what? On the limbo, man. Let's go. Manny, 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 the limbo's not a passenger ship. She's small cargo, son, and every hand on board works. There's an open spot for a mechanic that Gladys can take, but there's still no room for Manny. One crewmate named Naranja has a job that would be suitable for Manny, but he's still alive and kicking, so... I mean, I guess he's an undead skeleton, so he's not alive? But that doesn't really matter, because Manny still can't take a spot. Plus, Manny isn't even in the Maritime Union, so he can't work on the ship in the first place. Glottis is exempt due to the nature of his job, but Manny would have to get his hands on a membership card to show the captain. It sounds like to progress, Manny will need an authentic CB toolset for Glottis, a fake union card, and a way to get rid of Naranja so that Manny can steal his position on the ship. Manny heads off to speak with one of the CBs. It looks like the ones on the ground sold their tools to feed their families, and none of them are willing to part with their union cards. They still need their jobs after all. Past the bees, Manny notices a lighthouse in the distance. There's a path leading down to it, but it's locked tightly for the time time being. Manny returns to Calavera Cafe to ask Charlie about getting his hands on a fake union card. Charlie agrees to help him out as long as Manny can get his money back from Maximino. Supposedly there was a fixed race that cheated our nefarious friend out of a lot of money. Charlie hands over a VIP pass to the High Rollers Lounge. Supposedly there's a safe somewhere in the wine cellar with the suitcase full of money. Ooh, better not show that to Gladys. I kinda wanna show it to Gl <laughs> Check out this fancy pass to the High Rollers Lounge. Can you believe how full of themselves they are over there? I don't think their place is any more VIP than ours, do you? I don't know, I, I try to stay away from th that place. Really? Why? Cause of my, my, my problem. 
Gladys? Compadre? Well, looks like Gladys is gone. I wonder what the problem he mentioned was. Either way, we better head after him. He's probably on his way to the lounge. Sure enough, there he is, completely plastered at the High Rollers Lounge. Manny spots a worker moving a wine barrel into an elevator at the back of the kitchen and heads in to follow them down when he's stopped by a waiter who tells him that he's not allowed to be here. Manny snags a turkey baster from the shelf before booking it. Nick is sitting at a table in the corner. Manny speaks to him for a bit, noticing that he keeps a key inside of his cigarette case. Back in the kitchen, Manny tries to find a way to get himself into the wine cellar. He climbs a ladder to examine the top of the barrel of wine in the corner. While he's up there, the waiter walks into the small closet to search for something. Manny uses his scythe to bar the door to the closet, trapping the man inside. He can no longer bring refills to Gladys, who hops into the kitchen and chugs the remainder of the wine barrel in the corner. Now that it's empty, Manny uses the can opener from the track to cut open the barrel of wine, hopping inside. Gladys gets impatient once again, stomping into the kitchen and freeing the waiter. He tosses the scythe into the wine barrel where Manny retrieves it before returning to his hiding spot. Gladys demands more wine, for which the waiter obliges, putting in a call for another barrel. The empty one with Manny inside of it is brought down to the cellar for later disposal. Manny hops out, commandeering a forklift and driving into the elevator. As he heads upwards, he notices a large hole in the wall behind the safety gate. He cycles the elevator once more, sticking the prongs of the forklift through the gate so it gets stuck in the hole in the wall. He lifts the prongs with the control panel, creating an opening so that he can get inside. I think now is as good a time as any to talk about how terrible the walking can be in this game. Most of the time there are no issues with pathing, and you can just click where you want to walk and Manny will go there. But sometimes, things like this will happen. Go, go, Manny. Man, Manny, that is not the direction I clicked. Manny? Do we gotta have a talk? Do we ever have a conversation? Manny? Manny? Okay, go around the right side. D do that, I guess. Inside the hole is the exact suitcase Charlie was talking about. Manny opens it up to double check the contents. Dios mío, it's full of double end tickets. This could get a hundred souls on the number nine train. Something's not right about this. I get the feeling this suitcase belongs to someone more important than Chow Chilla Charlie. Despite his worries, a deal is a deal. Manny snags the case and leaves the lounge. Charlie cuts him off in the hallway, pointing a gun at his head and demanding the case. Thankfully, it's just for some extra leverage, and he keeps his word about giving Manny a union card. Manny runs his fake union card past Velasco, who claims that Manny should be fine since the captain is far-sighted. With that card acquired, Manny is the first and only person on the waiting list. Things are starting to get interesting. To most of us, at least. Gino is playing Dusk. What are you playing Dusk for? You're supposed to be watching. I need to be. Where's your insightful commentary? Where's your insightful commentary? I need my stimmy! Get one of those fidget cubes and watch the stream! I'm gonna gut you after your namesake. That's what I'm gonna fucking do. I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna rip you apart. I'm gonna say. By the time you're done. And that'll be awesome! Manny heads back to the kitchen in the blue casket, using his new turkey baster to gather some of the dirty hookah water. At this point, we were kinda stumped. I ended up leaving for a bit to get some lunch while everyone else discussed what to do next. At least that's what they were supposed to be doing. Well, I can't believe that is cutting people up. <laughs> Aaron, if we were on a stranded island and I had a cannibal as one totally of my friends, me. I know, I know. But here's the thing: I would ask your consent first. I would say I don't want you to, but I feel like eventually you're gonna start hallucinating me as a hot dog, and it doesn't matter what I say. Well, I don't need to hallucinate. <laughs> I'm just gonna look at you and be like, I can eat you. I'll be like, so what's the point of asking for my consent then? So that way I could be like, well, at least I tried. What? So you could decide <laughs> whether you feel guilt or not? But I wish you said I could eat him because now I feel really shit about doing this and i would be fucking shriveled up dying like while getting my fucking legs gnawed on i can eat my friend it's like but worse no mm. da no I, bad joke bad joke we have to have this entire bit cut now we can't no. complete this in. No. you you can't make that joke no, stop me. Then, by cutting all of this, we can't do Grim Fandango year two now. You've, uh, you've tainted it. You've ruined it. No, nah, it's fine. I'm back. 
Ben, you're gonna have to cut this entire bit because Gino made a joke. Ah, uh, son of a- In between the bickering, my friends actually had some good ideas to try out. Manny heads off to the blue casket to show off his allegiance to the revolution. He shows off his letter from Sal, shutting them up and proving his trust. A connection to a revolution legend like that is more than enough. They allow him to take their book, which Manny cracks open, finding information on workplace revolts and fighting for one's rights. That sounds like something the sea bees would probably be interested in. Manny brings this book to the barrel bees, helping them to find the words they need to convey the message that they want to spread. The workers shall control the means of production. The workers shall control the means of production. Yes, that's it. That's what I've been trying to say. Who will stop the fat cats of industry from building these ships with the pollen of the exploiting working class? I say we fight back. Hmm, what's this? Maybe a bee agitator? I say lay down your tools right now and show the man just who makes the honey around here. That does it. You know, I always thought bees came in two colors, yellow and black. But you look all red to me, my friend. Ah! Hey, what are you doing? We've got the right to assemble peacefully. Good. You're going to need a lot of assembly after we take you apart, comrade. It seems that Chief Bogan isn't too happy that people are fighting back. The sea bee begs Manny to help him find a lawyer. But how can Manny convince Nick to defend this bee? Manny talks to Nick, attempting to strong arm him into helping by threatening to tell Max about the adultery going on right under his nose. But Nick laughs. Manny would need proof to pull that one off, and only Lola has any evidence. Nick gets up to attend a meeting with Max, leaving his cigarette case behind. Manny snags it, running away before anyone notices. He can't get it open, but there has to be a way to pry it open somewhere around here. Manny heads up to the security checkpoint, taking a swig from the alcohol to get the gold flakes into his system so that they'll be picked up by the metal detector even after he empties his pockets. This earns him a strip search, resulting in a long and boring anecdote from Carla. Manny clearly isn't interested in this, and he just asks her for the metal detector. She gets annoyed at his disinterest, tossing the device out the window and into the cat litter below before storming back to her post. Manny eyes a note on the wall, politely asking employees to stop using the bomb detonation chamber in the floor to crack open walnuts. Maybe it can crack open a cigarette case instead. Manny fabricates a story about a shifty-looking man dropping the case off before making a hasty getaway. This is enough to make Carla stuff it into the chamber, blowing it to pieces and leaving only the key behind. Good thing it wasn't actually a bomb. Okay, 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 note, 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 um... You have 30 seconds to do your ad read, XOXO, Aaron. Don't worry, it doesn't start until you finish reading this letter, so don't look away. Mwah! God damn it, okay. This video has been sponsored by Gamersups. Gamersups sell a variety of delicious beverages from their wonderful tea to their far more well-known energy formula. It's delicious, it's keto-friendly, it has zero calories, and it's full of vitamins. It's a great source of energy or just a tasty beverage if you get the caffeine-free versions. They have a ton of flavors ranging from some normal stuff to flavors made by content creators to a crossover with Jujutsu Kaisen that I got to try out recently and it was really good. If you guys want to use a discount while supporting the channel, please use code BENAGAIN for 10% off your order. Oh. Why the hell would you send me a bomb during an ad read? Because it was funny, and it does a lot of damage. But I, what, are you, you know what, fair. Manny stomps down to the kitty litter to get that metal detector, but there's no way he's gonna go swimming around in feces to get that thing. This is actually one of my favorite puzzles. When you open your inventory and hover over your scythe, the metal detector is close enough to sense the metal and it starts beeping softly. This is your indicator to grab the scythe and wave it around above the litter to find where the device is before scooping it out with the blade. Manny takes the key from the cigarette case and uses it on the lighthouse. Lola, did Nick do this to you? Yeah, he wanted that picture real bad, but he's never gonna find it, that thing. I'll get him, Lola. I'll show Max the picture for you and fix Nick for good. Just tell me where you hid it. Oh, Manny, it's all my fault. Always falling for the wrong guys. You know, I even had a thing for you once. But you were so hung up on that Meche woman, I figured I didn't have a chance. Lola, where's the picture? Tell me, Manny. But I've had a chance. Never mind. You just want Olivia for me. 
tell her to improve her taste in men, or she'll end up just like me. Tell her to get a nice guy, Manny. Like you. Lola! Lola! Lola left behind a card with a picture of a tongue accompanied by the number 22. This is part of Lupe's coat organization system, meaning it's time to head back to Cafe Calavera. Lupe grabs the coat associated with card 22. There's a paper in the pocket, but no camera. It reads number 36, the Rusty Anchor. This isn't one of the coat cards, it's actually one of the designs available at the tattoo parlor. Manny enters the parlor, but the tattoo artist is still preoccupied. Manny opens up the refrigerator door, taking too much power and slowing down the tattoo gun. The tattoo artist gets angry, revealing that the man getting the tattoo is Naranja. Manny cracks open the door again, pulling out a drawer to keep it from closing on itself and moving over to Naranja's bottle. The tattoo artist turns around again to yell about the door being open, and Manny takes the time to put his hookah water into the bottle. This knocks Naranja clean out, and our artist here doesn't work on drunks. Manny snags the dog tags from Naranja's unconscious body, then shows the tattoo card to the artist. Inside the binder where that design is marked, there's a photo that Lola left behind of one of the cat races. This puzzle is is one of the rougher ones. We didn't find it out the way you were supposed to and never did. You're supposed to use the ticket printer to make a fake ticket, which you can then redeem for a prize at the racing center. That's where the photo is hidden. You need three pieces of information. One is the week of the event, one is the number of the race, and one is the day of the race. The number of the race is easy enough to figure out. All you have to do is look at the big number in the photo. We figured out that it was week two because of the large statue of a cat in the foyer. When Manny reads the plaque of the stuffed cat, it says that he won during week two. Apparently this is a photo of that race so we can put that information into the printer. All that's left is to figure out the day, which is easy enough because the devs only made one ticket model. Manny's hand covers up the numbers in question, but it clearly says Tuesday right there on the front. Manny prints out the ticket and turns it in, retrieving the photo of the affair. He shows it to Nick, blackmailing the lawyer into defending the CB. And Nick isn't lying about being a good lawyer. He gets his client free in minutes. The worker bees have left behind their tools, which Manny can't carry himself, but Gladys will be able to pick up before they board the ship. That means all that's left to do is get rid of Naranja for good. He's already unconscious and will most likely miss the departure, but we need concrete evidence of him being gone to secure a spot on the boat. Manny hands the metal detector over to the coroner as a show of goodwill. He uses it to try and find any identifying features that might appear on the two sprouted corpses. While his back is turned, Manny tosses Naranja's dog tags onto the body. The coroner immediately finds them, calling Velasco to let him know that he's lost a sailor. Now that a spot is open on the ship, Velasco's not only allowing Manny to take the job, Job. He demands that he take the job. Now we just need to get Glottis to the ship. Now what's the most logical way to do that? I know, destroying our business! Manny heads back to Cafe Calavera, noting that Chief Bogan has returned. Manny sabotages his gambling one final time. Fourteen. Fourteen is the winner. Look at those. I think you mean two. Am I correct? Uh, no, monsieur. Fourteen is the winner. I think you've made a mistake. I'm sorry, sir. Thirteen is the winning number. Better luck next time, eh? That does it! That Calavera is getting too big for his britches. I don't like raiding businesses and shutting them down. But someone's got to teach Manuel a lesson in law and order. This way, back here. Open those paddy wagons up and start filling them. And somebody find Calavera. I want to interrogate him personally. Raided? How long are they going to close it for? Ah, huh. yeah, you better cut off the big guy's credit then. Yeah, yeah, throw the drunk out on his big orange butt. And bring me Calavera so we can talk about his debt. Hey, come on! You gotta let me back in! I'm a VIP! Does that stand for very inebriated pianist? Oh, Manny, I don't wanna be a pianist anymore. I'm a mechanic. I know, that's why I got you a new job. Come on, let's go pick up your tools. <laughs> And I can do whatever I want to the engine? Make it faster? Sure, but you'll be plenty busy just keeping her afloat. Thanks for the gig. 
and for not asking too many questions. Hell, after what happened in Naranja, I can see why you'd leave town. Let's just hope I don't have to go fishing you out of the drink again. I'll stay under next time, I promise. Captain, Captain Calavera? Puerto Zapato, sailor. We're here at last. Beautiful port, isn't she? Yes, sir. Well, there's some customs officials down below, sir. They want to search the ship. Fine, fine. We've got nothing to hide, eh? No skeletons in our closet. <laughs> yes, sir. Secure the bow, boys. Like a rock this time. Manuel. Salvador? I hope this very urgent message gets to you in time. Our man in Zapato says Miss Colomar never made it to the port. It said she threw herself overboard at the Pearl. I don't know if you believe that. Whatever you do, do not land in Puerto Zapato. It's a trap. Assassins will attempt to board your ship disguised as customs agents. Beware, and viva la revolución! What an insane ending to the chapter. Somehow, in only one year, Manny managed to rise through the ranks once again, becoming captain of the vessel. I definitely enjoyed year two a lot more than year one, but it still had its issues. The story wasn't nearly as interesting, but it still kept my attention fairly thoroughly. I like that people are still getting sprouted, I just wish there was more of a focus on Sal and the LSA. Thankfully, from the end credit scenes, it seems like that will be the case for year three. The puzzles all around were way better designed. I felt like everything made complete sense this time around, with few exceptions to the formula. The only puzzles that seemed kind of out of left field were the shutting down of Café Calavera and the ticket printing. For the café, I feel like there were other ways that made more sense to get Glottis to head home, although nothing nearly as dramatic as what we ended up getting. It reinforced the corruption that the writers keep drawing our attention to, so I'm sure it was just used for emphasis, even if it made things confusing at the end. As for the ticket, I don't really know where we were supposed to get that information. If we missed it somewhere, obviously, I would love to know in the comments. All the sources I've found online have just listed the answer to the puzzle without saying how to get it. I genuinely believe that this was an overall improvement, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how the series goes from here. I hope to see you all again. Have a great rest of your day.